you ever play a game you loved as a kid and you completely forget about it? A lot of times it's really exciting to rediscover those games because you're like, dang, I remember this game. Zapper is not like that at all for me. I played this game as a kid and that's that's all I remember. I, there, there was no dang moment for me. It was just, oh yeah, I remember beating it. It's really it. It's all I can remember. I cannot remember anything else from this game, but recently I found myself with a copy of it for GameCube, so why don't we re-experience this and find out what it was that I forgot. Was it good? Was it bad? Or was it just not a very memorable game? Let's find out. The title screen is pretty elaborate for a game like this. If you wait long enough, he'll knock on the screen as if he's saying, Hello! Ugh, look how smug he looks in the front cover. He didn't look like that in the European version. He actually looks pissed on that one. Usually it's the American versions that get the angrified covers, but this time we got the DreamWorks face. Cool. Like many games of its era, there's a CG cutscene. Zapper's watching TV with his little brother, and after fighting over the remote, they screw up the TV antenna. After a moment of inspiration, Zapper decides to use his little brother as a new antenna. After failing to get a good signal, he holds the poor guy out the window. This is why I'm glad I never had an older brother growing up. Too stoked over the TV working to realize, Zapper lets his brother get snatched up by a magpie. And this starts the adventure to save his brother. Not because he loves his brother, but because he wants to watch TV. Wow, what a selfish dick. Can you imagine if in Luigi's Mansion, Luigi only wanted to save Mario so he could turn the TV into AV mode for him? So here we finally get to play the game, and uh, you ever play any of the Frogger games? Like the, the Game Boy Advance ones or the PlayStation 2 ones? It's just like that. You're confined to four-directional grid-based movement. Whoa, hang on. Frogger? Zapper. This game's a goddamn Frogger clone. Who the hell makes a Frogger clone? What's next, we gonna make a Cubert clone? Holding the stick forward doesn't actually continuously move you forward. You'll have to tap it each time you want to move up a space. So naturally, it's better to use a directional pad for this sort of thing. Kinda makes me wish I had the PS2 version so I could use this and not this microscopic excuse of a D-pad. Beyond that, there's a jump button that'll skip a space or jump to a high ledge. You'll need it for clearing gaps and scaling to higher areas. Holding down the jump button will make Zapper fly. It doesn't actually do anything different, you'll just still land on the same space doing that, but the longer animation can delay your landing, helping you time the jump in the case you need to wait for an obstacle or an enemy to move. I understand the intention behind it, but I never needed to use it. Why even bother programming something like this if you're not going to design levels that actually make use of it? it? Just seems like a waste. You can use a zap attack with a B button. It'll only defeat weak enemies, but it's also used for interacting with switches and objects. You can rotate in place using the shoulder buttons. This works great for any time you need to face a certain direction to make a jump, while taking a step in that direction would make you fall to your death. Speaking of which, I find that happens a lot in this game. Level design isn't always straightforward. Sometimes it's hard to tell where you can jump and where you can't. Like here, come on, I can't jump down from here? And this spot here too, how am I supposed to get down there? With the weird perspective, it becomes difficult to figure out which tile you have to jump off of. And even when I did land dead center on it, I fell right through it. There's a handful of power-ups you'll find in the game. Well, not so much handful as there's two... The first are flocks of fireflies that'll supercharge your zap. With one of these, you can destroy the metal crates, activate switches from afar, or wipe out some enemies you normally can't kill. The other is a helmet that'll let you take a hit. If you get hit while wearing it, you lose it, but you won't take damage. It's very similar to the shield in the Sonic games. This is one of those games where one hit kills you and makes you respawn at the last checkpoint. There's a lot of death animations, much like Crash Bandicoot, but a lot of them are just kind of gross. Like, I get it, he's a bug, so you can get away with showing his guts in an E-rated game, but seeing that array of green organs littering the inside of his split-in-half body is... This is kind of gross. They're also kind of hard to appreciate when you only get to see them from such a zoomed out and awkward overhead camera angle. Come to think of it, after killing some enemies, they straight up leave a blood stain. Like, not a green one, a red one. That's blood. And these enemies aren't even bugs, so how they wrote this one off as just comic mischief is beyond me. The objective in each stage is to find and collect six magpie eggs. 
because for some reason doing this will find the magpie that took your brother. There's no rhyme or reason to it, you just do it because the game tells you. If you're having trouble finding one, you can press the Y button to use a radar that'll point you in the direction. I never really needed to use it, but it's handy if you do get lost. As you pick them up, the game puts them in a little egg crate at the bottom left for you. I, I, I think that's cool. I like that. Land on the sixth and final one, level's over. As you get further into the game, it introduces more types of eggs. One has spreaded legs and will walk in circles. You'll have to zap it before you can collect it. If you don't zap it, running into it will kill you, so don't don't do that. The other one has a head hatched out too, and it deliberately walks away from you, forcing you to jump tiles in quick succession to land adjacent to it before it can step to another one. These kinds of enemies only take a step every time you take a step. Some of them are really annoying too, especially these cowboy ones here. Leave me alone, dude. Stop. Outside of the eggs, there's also fireflies to collect, 100 in each stage. I guess this game's a collect-a-thon. Some of the Firefly flocks I mentioned earlier that supercharge you will require having collected a certain amount in the stage before they activate. If you want to collect everything in the level, you'll have to find the hidden areas. These are often found by simply entering a secret door or by activating one of these mechanical tiles, creating a bridge. You can activate them by using the Golden Fireflies. Every now and then, you'll come across these ones. You'll have to collect them in a certain order, getting whichever one is glowing next. Doing this will give you a golden charge you can use to power the next switch you find. Now, I appreciate the concept of getting the items in the right order in a platformer, and it's worked in many other games, but here I don't feel as if they're placed in whatever order is most challenging, rather than whatever order is just most inconvenient. You'll find yourself hopping around and backtracking excessively in each small segment that has these things just to get them in the right order. Half the time, it's just obnoxious, really. But if you manage to collect every firefly in the stage, you'll gain access to a bonus level. Here you've got one straight shot to get everything and get to the end of this winding and linear path. Do it successfully and you're rewarded with a brand new hat to replace the helmet. You can change whichever hat you want to take place in the helmet from the bonus screen. That's a decent reward, I really dig wearing a cowboy hat instead of that stupid helmet. Level variety is alright I guess, it goes beyond having just the forest and cave stages, it eventually evolves into these mechanical levels with these spinning cogs. And then there's Spookville. And let me tell you, just just when I was thinking there's nothing spooky about this town, oh, ugh. The only level that really changes things up a bit is this one sewer level. You're constantly moving forward, strafing around the entire circumference of the pipe. Unfortunately, it's the only level like this in the whole game. I think they could have had at least one more like this. Music in this game, it's not bad. It's a healthy dose of 80s hip hop sprinkled with funky beats and record scratches nothing I'm gonna remember the game for, but, you know, it's great background noise. The game's graphics, on the other hand, they're not very good. Textures are really muddy, but in a game like this, who really cares? I mean, it's a Frogger clone that came out in 2002, made by... Wait, who made this game? I usually talk about that at the beginning of the video, but I forgot this time. Blitz Games! Blitz Games, formerly known as Interactive Studios. Well, I'll be damned, the guys that made Glover made this game. Cool. Apparently they made Frogger 2 on the PS1. Jeez, it all comes full circle. Well, one thing I do like about this game is whenever Zapper falls off a cliff, he's like, Whoa! Whoa! But yeah, that's really it. You hop across a level, making jumps, not running into the enemies. There really isn't anything more to it than that. It's simplified platforming that's really just about timing the jumps, nothing more, nothing less. There's four worlds, each containing one to four levels, so total, there's not that many levels in the game. It's not a super long game, you can beat it in just a couple of hours. There's also no boss fights in the game, save for the final boss fight, which actually isn't bad. I think the game could have used more of them. But yeah, you beat the magpie, you get Zipper back, and you all live happily ever after. Well, Zapper does. It's a never-ending hellish nightmare for Zipper. Jesus, Zapper, you heartless human being. Cricket. I feel bad for the kid. He just can't catch a break. He's probably better off being eaten by the magpie, in all brutal honesty. Yep, that's all there really is to the main game, so, uh, why don't we take a look at some of the other modes? Starting with the multiplayer. Yeah, this game's got a multiplayer. There's five game modes total. The first is Zipper Ball, a game where you try to toss Zipper into the goal more than your opponent. There's also Last Man Standing and Deathmatch, which are exactly what they sound like. Then there's Stranglehold, a King of the Hill type game where you need to hold on the Zipper as long as possible. And finally, Death by Zipper, which is the same as Last Man Standing, but with enemies on the board. It's not a very fun or well thought out multiplayer game. My friend Dylan and I quickly found an exploit in which you can just get another player in an infinite stun lock by zapping 
killing them and then jumping on them afterwards. Plain and simple, multiplayer really sucks. But there's also an arcade mode where you can replay levels trying to do it in the shortest amount of time possible. I've never been in a time attack, so I guess there's nothing left for me here. But yeah, that zapper, that's all there really is to it. It's not a particularly good game, not a particularly bad game either. It's just the kind of game your parents would wreck you on the weekend to kill the time. Didn't really leave a bad taste in my mouth, but didn't really leave me wanting more either. Key features, non-stop frantic action. That's, uh, that's subject to debate. Well, I guess my final verdict on Zapper is that it's about as good as a PS2 Frogger game can get. But, uh, keep in mind the PS2 Frogger games are, like, only okay. One wicked cricket. <coughs>